Chapter four of the book is talking about motion to the planets, how gravity makes everything go around the sun. And one of the first steps is realizing it does go around the sun. So that was the uh, work of uh, Nicholas Copernicus. Uh, remember Aristarchus in the ancient world figured it out first, but Copernicus is really the one who put it on a much more solid footing for uh, ast uh, astronomy. He worked through the mathematics of this and showed that going around the sun really can explain a lot of things. And so that that happened. And then, uh, then in, in fairly short order, a couple things happened in Europe that, that related to other astronomers looking at the sky and trying to figure out what was going on. Your book doesn't mention uh, this person, but uh, Giordano Bruno uh, lived actually in Venice, and he uh, was one that accepted the heliocentric model. He, he thought, well, this, this seems to make sense. The Copernican idea, everything going around the sun makes a whole lot of sense. And um, so he, but he extended the model. He then took one of the big criticisms that astronomers had against the heliocentric model. And that was if Earth goes around the sun, we keep moving back and forth, which means that the angle to the stars should keep shifting. It does, it, but it is such a tiny shift, it was not visible with the instruments that they had at that time. This is before actually telescopes. And so uh, late, late uh, uh, 1500s, telescopes had not been pointed at the sky yet. And so uh, there was no way of measuring that tiny little shift. And so uh, Bruno uh, actually accepted the shift was there and too small. Other astronomers said there's no shift, so Earth doesn't move. But he said, no, maybe Earth is moving, but maybe that's because the stars are so far away, the shift is tiny. Well, he went one step further. But that said, if the stars are that far away, to be as bright as they are in the sky, they've got to be about as bright as the sun. He said, well, maybe they are suns. Okay. And then he says, you know, maybe they got planets around them just like their planets around the sun. And then he, then he expanded on the idea of a planet. You know, up to this point, a planet was simply one of those little dots in the sky that moves. Bruno said, if the planets go around the sun and the, sun, and the earth goes around the sun, well, it means the earth does the same thing as a planet. So maybe earth is a planet. It goes around the sun. Maybe that's what planets do. And then he said, well, wait a minute. If earth is a planet, you look around, earth is a world. Maybe these planets are worlds. Not just dots in the sky, but entire worlds like our Earth. And maybe the other stars have worlds that go around them. Then he comes back and says, well, wait a minute. We've got life on Earth. Maybe there's life. Maybe there's people living on these planets out there. If the planets are worlds, maybe they have people living on them. And so now th this is where he got into real deep trouble. Because at this point, remember, this is about the time that the church was, was going after people that, that, that said anything that was perceived as maybe potentially uh, heretical or challenged anything the church had to say. So he comes along and says, well, maybe all these worlds have people on them and maybe Christ came and got crucified on each of the worlds. And, of course, you know, that, that, that immediately was declared to be heresy. And so they told him to stop saying that. He did not stop saying that. And at that point, they burned him at the stake. And so then he quit saying that. Okay. But in Venice, right afterwards, you know, uh, 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 not right afterwards, but, but hundreds of years later, what they did was they said, oh, Okay, maybe we shouldn't have burned him at the stake. Maybe he was right. You know, Earth is a planet and planets are worlds. Not that they had people on them, not that Christ got crucified on them, but maybe, in fact, you know, that the, the, they, they actually do have uh, their worlds. And so the idea was that, that uh, uh, he may have been right about that part. And so what they did was uh, they a... Uh, statue in his honor right in Ven Venice, you know, to, to, to say, oh, sorry, okay, all better now. Okay, so he was, he was burned at the stake in 1600 
for saying that not only was Copernicus right, but all the planets are in fact worlds and Earth is a planet. The next person we want to talk about is Tycho Brahe. Uh, now, typically we just call him Tycho rather than, than Brahe. Uh, he was born about three years after Copernicus died. And so mid-1500s, he began studies in Copenhagen and was uh, studying the sky. And his interest in astronomy really got started because that's about when there was a partial eclipse. And it's like, oh, wow, I, I, I want to understand how this works. And then a number of years later, he notices a brand new star in the constellation Cassiopeia. And so we, this is a supernova, which is an exploding star. He didn't know what that was. He didn't know it was a new star. And so he starts off studying uh, the heavens. Now, he's got an interesting backstory. We often, you know, the book talks about Copernicus or, uh, and talks a little bit about Tycho. Uh, but it doesn't really give his backstory. It just says that that he started studying the sky and realized that that there's there's some other kind of observations out there. Okay, but I want to say a little bit more about Tycho's backstory. Uh, turns out that he was the youngest son um, of his parents, and um, they gave they let his um, uncle raise him. His uncle had no sons, and so he, his uncle raised him. Uh, and that way he could be the heir to his uncle's uh, uh, inheritance. His uncle was actually a servant to the king of Denmark. And so uh, the servant to the king is actually a f fairly high-ranking position. And so he grew up as a, in a life of privilege. And, um, and so a, a, in a life of privilege that he knew, um, he kind of got to be a spoiled brat. And he also drank very heavily and was frequently getting into sword duels with people. On one of these sword duels, he actually got his nose cut off. And so for the rest of his life, he wore this, this prosthesis uh, 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 on the end of his nose, you know, where his nose had gotten cut off. Uh, in fact, when they, when they found his uh, uh, bones uh, a few decades ago, they noticed that the kind of, they, they actually look at the staining in the bones to find out the kind of metal. Uh, it turns out it was, it was a type of bronze that he used for uh, a nose prosthesis. And, and, and some of the metal actually leached into his bones. Uh, but anyway, so he starts off studying astronomy and um, starts studying it very carefully um, and uh, ends up um, with a very special patronage from the king. And the reason is that his uncle, uh, at one day the king was... was uh, uh, touring uh, some, some, some uh, out, out, uh, outer provinces and slipped and fell into a moat at a castle. Uh, his uncle, uh, Tycho's uncle, had dived in, rescued the king, but unfortunately drowned in the process. And so the king you know, really wanted to, to uh, reward Tycho. Well, the problem is Tycho's not a nice guy, and he's drunk, and he's a belligerent drunk and gets into duels. And so the king decides to basically give him an island in the middle of the North Sea, the island of Havin. Well, Havin already had people there, and so he got the people there to build him this uh, place that he calls Uraniborg, uh, the, the, the city of the heavens. And so the Uraniborg is, is, is Tycho's palace, uh, but at this palace was several special features designed to allow him to observe the sky. Uh, and namely what's called the mural quadrant. The mural quadrant was like a giant, huge protractor uh, on the side of a building that he could line up and measure the exact altitude of stars as they pass by the meridian. And he could do this uh, to a fraction of a degree. The best naked eye observations in all of history. So doing this, he starts measuring the sky and he realizes some interesting things. First of all, he is studying these motions and he realizes that, that it's completely inconceivable 
from what he sees that the planets are, in fact, going around Earth. Doesn't seem to make any sense. They get brighter, they get dimmer, the positions shift a little bit, and, and that doesn't really make sense for something that, that, that is going around. He looks at this and says, well, you, this retrograde motion is happening when it's brightest and in opposition, opposite the sun. He says that really seems to work with what Copernicus said. But he's not willing to shift you know, the, the entire universe to the sun. So he has the idea, and he says, well, uh, all the plants go around the sun. But the sun goes around the earth. So his idea, which is kind of odd, is that the earth is the center of the universe. The moon goes around the earth. The, the sun goes around the earth. And then all the planets go around the sun. Okay. And so that, that, that keeps the, sun, the earth at the center of the universe. It shifts the center of everything else to the sun. And, and, and this kind of model, if you go through the math, is, is pretty much the same as what Copernicus had. But he comes up with this idea because he says if you look at the stars, you cannot see, even with his mural quadrant, you do not see parallax, which is that tiny shift that, that happens in the sky. Your book mentions the parallax, and that's, that's this tiny shift that happens in the sky, and, and, and he can't see it, so he still assumes that... The sun, the, 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 the sun is, is going around the earth. Okay. So that was the, uh, uh, the big deal here. And he publishes this uh, 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 as, as, a new, as a new way of looking at the sky to compete with Copernicus.